Every runner has a story. What about you? What's your story? Running isn't easy. We've all overcome struggles to get to where we are. Maybe you're struggling now. What is it that stands in your way of reaching your full potential as a runner? And are you willing to do what it takes to get there? If you're not sure, listen to this story about how this runner overcame an obstacle that seemed absolutely impossible. And remember, if they can do it, you can do it too. What are your running goals? Do you need help recovering from a running injury? Do you need help developing a training plan? Maybe you've never ran before and you just want to get started. Let us help you reach that big goal of yours. Here at Body Smart, we help runners maximize their performance and stay on the road. To learn more, ask questions, or to set up your first free appointment, go to bodysmartutah.com or call us at 801-479-4471. Hello and welcome to Running Unbroken. Um, I'm Mark, this is Melody, and today we have Jeffrey Binney with us. Ultra runner, athlete, motivational speaker, extraordinaire, right? Yeah, you Esquire, know. all those <laughs> things. Yeah. <it's> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, man, I, I don't remember being, you just have so many fun stories and you're just such a, you're such a cool guy. But uh, yeah, I, I just tell us, tell us your story. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, um, <laughs> Grew up in Missouri, uh, an artsy kid, bona fide grade A indoor kid. <laughs> and I was never an athlete. I, like I hated, I hated sports. Uh, I was forced to do them, um, so I did them, but I didn't enjoy it. And I, I hit thirty. My mom had been diagnosed with heart failure when I was eleven, and she unfortunately finally lost her battle, and I was like right on the same track. I was a hundred pounds heavier than I am now. I had never, never done anything for my health, uh, maybe ever, but definitely not recently. <laughs> and I discovered trail running. I was, uh, she was in the ICU for two months at the end of her life. And I was in the waiting room for two months. I discovered a trail running magazine. They had subscriptions to a bunch of obscure, what I thought was obscure. Now I read it <laughs> religiously, uh, but uh, obscure <laughs> magazines. I was like, this sounds kind of silly. Like, I wonder if I could do this. And we had a really <laughs> I love that. silly. I wonder if I love that. That's a great <laughs> we had a <clears throat> especially bad day in the hospital, and I kind of in a fit of anger, rage, whatever you want to call it, went and bought a pair of shoes and went out to a state park and went for a run. Uh, I don't think I could actually run more than maybe a quarter of a mile at a time, but I immediately just flip and loved it. Uh, I felt like a little kid, I was jumping over logs and getting muddy. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is fun. And there was nobody there watching me. We talked about this earlier. There's nobody there watching me or timing me or watching my fat jiggle. You know, to me, <laughs> running was um, once a year in PE class, my PE teacher standing with the stopwatch, timing mm -hmm. us for the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. I think it was and the worst. Yeah, it was the worst. Yes. About that? We it all have some trauma from that. Yeah. Like, I don't mean to, to, to throw the T word out lightly, but it was pretty hard for some of this. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I remember saying, like, I wonder how much of this I can walk without them yelling at me. And, and so that was my history. And yeah. uh, suddenly I realized that running could be something totally different than what I thought it was. And it turned out, I kind of liked it a lot. So that's awesome. anyway, that's a not so concise uh, backstory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The long story short, we both have seen uh, your film once is enough, which oh, is thanks. awesome, by the way. Oh. Check it um, out for sure, hundred percent. Yeah. So, yeah. but but for people who haven't seen, it, I guess that kind of was a long story short. But but maybe tell us a little bit more about you know jumping into Leadville and and kind of what happened after that. Yeah, well, you know, after my mom passed away, I was I was living in New York, um, working as an actor in theater. I had started getting into stand up more, and I wanted to move to Los Angeles. I moved to Los Angeles, and all I wanted to do was write and tell jokes and disappear into the woods to run. And Seems uh, like life, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> well, a friend. I mean, I wasn't in the best place uh, mm -hmm. emotionally at the time, and one of my good friends. Um, I had a habit of just kind of like disappearing and on mm -hmm. Monday I'd come back to civiliz civilization <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, sorry, I, I went 
backpacking for the weekend and forgot to tell anybody. <laughs> uh, my friend was like, yeah, I wonder if there's a more constructive way to be <laughs> doing these I things. I this, this is the podcast you're on and not a dateline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, totally. But so I had this idea and I was like, man, what if I... What if I did something like really crazy, like tried to run a 100 mile ultra marathon? Um, and then what if like that would be give me great material for for writing? Um, that's the best. Most people feel that that's the best fix for writer's block is like, go do something. Uh -huh. It's really hard to like have a new creative idea when you're sitting in a dark room on a sofa, like go experience life, be around some people, do some weird things you wouldn't normally do. Yeah. And something is <laughs> going to, to happen, right? Yeah. <clears throat> So I had the idea for this film. I was like, what if I could document me trying to, to run this 100 miler, film my first hour set of material about the experience, mm -hmm. and then slam them together. So that's where the idea for the film came from. And we were trying to decide the first race that I should try. And I went straight to Leadville. <laughs> and uh, it was- Which is, tell, tell the audience a little bit about Leadville. It's, it's a yeah. tough race. Yeah, so Leadville is one of the older 100 milers in the US. It's one of the um, the four, what's it called? Something Crown? The, Ugh. I forget the name too. Something Crown of Ultra Running. Yeah. Yeah, it's Western States. Anyway, it's, it's, <laughs> one, of the, it's one of the four major 100 milers in the US. <laughs> It's in Colorado in the mountains. Uh, I think Hard Rock has more elevation change, but I think after Hard Rock, I think it's either second or third in, in terms of elevation change. Mm -hmm. Not the not the obvious choice for an overweight <laughs> 35 year old dude, but the big thing was they didn't have a qualifying time. <clears throat> and um, the lottery was uh, not quite as hard to, to win as like Western states. People are waiting like years and years for us, mm -hmm. at least at the time. I think Leadville is probably harder now. But so for some seemingly good reasons, we settled on Leadville. Um, <laughs> but looking back, I don't know if it was the best choice. It was an amazing run. I, I, we also chose it because number one, it's in a beautiful place and has oh, yeah. such a like an awesome backstory. The the, the, totally. the man and woman who started it are, are really interesting characters. Totally. Um, it started at, from an effort. It was a, a mining town. The town was like dying essentially. And, and these two people who had grown up there were like, what can we do to bring people here? Like the t our, mm -hmm. our town is literally dying. Um, and one of them was like, I heard about these people in California running 100 miles. I wonder if we could do something like that here. Yeah. And now it's turned that town into just a madhouse all summer. It's a whole summer of half marathons, marathons, That's mountain awesome. bike races. Yeah, it's really Have you read Born to Run? Yes. Just, okay. Yeah. 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 When you are now, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you say it? Tarahumara? The, the Tarahumara. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see people running either uh, barefoot or in sandals. Because I think they ran in sandals, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It blows my mind. I, I know. Maybe I should give it a go, but... <laughs> No. I mean, feet. if you like ultras, then you... <laughs> I do like pain, so <laughs> maybe it's for me. <clears throat> but tell so I can't remember his name. The guy that like started going to Leadville in like '88 and just hasn't. The Bill Duper. Bill Duper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me, like, how did you just like? How did you find this guy? <laughs> so I mean, everybody knows Bill Duper. <laughs> Um, he, he is just a uh, an ultra running super fan, and he uh, I had seen a really interesting uh, short documentary uh, about how he if you I think we mentioned in, in my film when he's speaking uh, I think he says uh, he has been at Bloodville every year since I think the, the 70s. very first yeah the very, the very first, first or one second like year something like that yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but he had never been to Western States, which is another popular 100 miler in California. And um, it's like Ian Sharman and a bunch of the other uh, uh, better known runners uh, pooled together money to send him to Western States. And this oh. mini documentary follows him. That's so cool. Oh, yeah, it's that. so good. And he is yeah. just the loveliest, loveliest person. And he lives there in, in Leadville. I mean, Leadville is a town of maybe. 200 people, 300 people max. Mm -hmm. um, so he was pretty easy to find. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, He's yeah. also good friends with Ian Sharman. And I was training oh, okay, with okay. Ian Sharman. So. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, so, so, so exciting to meet him. And unfortunately, he, he passed away a few years ago. Um, oh. But gosh, I think he was in his late 90s. So. Yeah. 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 Well, it sounds like he lived a good life watching all. Yeah, all and he, everyone would be 
uh, attuned to his projections because every Leadville he would he would put out who he thought was uh, was going to win, what he thought the the, the finishing order was oh, going to be. Yeah, awesome. like, like a literal super fan, this guy. Yeah, yeah. that's so fun. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so so you went to do Leadville and and then what happened? Yeah. So spoiler alert. <laughs> um, so Leadville went great until it didn't. I got to. I think it's at like mile 46. It's right before the halfway point, uh, Hope Pass. It's it's kind of the, the pinnacle of the course. The course is a 50 mile out and back and starting at mile 42-ish, uh, you have a, a, a climb over Hope Pass, um, back down the other side, and then you have to turn around and come back. Yeah. And I missed the cutoff time at mile, at mile 46. And it was pretty brutal because um, you know, it's not a surprise. Like, you know that you're, I mean, you're incessantly checking no. your time and you're, yeah. you're doing the doing the the math in your head. So, you know, it was a long four mile climb up that mountain knowing that I was behind. And you start thinking of all the possibilities, you know, like maybe my watch is broken or maybe they're not following the rules this year. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and I was with, uh, I had ended up in a little misery club of other people who were in the same boat and we were just chugging up the mountain. One man was, there were sections where he w was literally crawling oh, wow. um, on all fours. It was pretty, it was pretty brutal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we approached the, the aid station. Mm -hmm. That aid station, the only way they can get the supplies up there, mm -hmm. or maybe not the only way, but the easiest way or the way they choose to get supplies up there is on alpacas. Did you see the alpacas? Yes, I, I love it. Like, it was like yeah. perfect shot smiling at you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that ale. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So Wipe that smile from your face, alpaca. <laughs> So, yeah, it's so surreal. I mean, you're you're about to top a 10,000 foot pass in one of the prettiest parts of the country. There are alpacas. You're in a beautiful meadow. I'm and, sure it was hard to enjoy it. At the oh, yeah. You're about to get like, you know, some of the like worst news that I've, that I've ever gotten. This lovely man stepped out from the aid station to greet us. We were all still in a little group. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one woman in the group who on the way up, she had told us that this was either her third second or third attempt oh. and her last one or two attempts she had gotten pulled at that same aid station oh, no, that's terrible and so he approached our group and he's like hey everyone hope you're hope you're feeling okay get some water get some stuff you know you've missed the cutoff so oh. get what you need take a break and then go ahead and head back down that was the, the worst thing like yeah. Oh. After that, I had to hike six miles back down the trail. Oh, yeah. oh, my goodness. But the second he said that, she just, like, lost oh. it. <clears throat> That's and terrible. the one, the one, like, no, I mean, the whole thing as a whole was a positive experience, even though it was yeah. a huge failure and, you know, a lot of things to, to work through. Overall, it was an amazing experience. Oh, yeah. But uh, after he came out and told this, uh, told us, that we hadn't made it, a guy popped out from behind the uh, aid station tent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was her uh, fiance, and he mm -hmm. had made arrangements for them to get married. <gasps> He knew that she probably wasn't going to make it. So he he was they were he was going to do it at the end, and he yeah. knew at the last aid station that she probably wasn't going to make it. So uh -huh. he like got ahead of her and went up so that he was there. Oh my, oh my gosh, God. that is so that cool. pretty cool, awesome. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what a cool way to turn like a, what could have been negative experience into a positive. Yeah, I, I've told a few experience. people that story, and I guess there's a lot of talk around like yeah. proposals and things at runs because some people it's not sure. <laughs> yeah, it's not where they want to be. Proposed to, <laughs> they're not gross and sweaty. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I think I think she was pretty on board with it. Oh, so, yeah. that's yeah. awesome. That's yeah. so cool. Oh, cool. Anyway, as as usual, I got off on tangents, but that's what happened at Leadville. So <clears throat> okay. pretty, pretty, pretty disappointing. I guess. Yeah. The one positive takeaway was that I uh, I still feel felt great. Like I didn't. I, I felt uh, some comfort in the fact that I didn't quit. I could have kept going. I would have loved to have kept going. <laughs> But those time cutoffs are always my nemesis. Yeah. Uh, I'm just a big guy, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how much you train if you're carrying an extra eighty pounds in a backpack uh, <laughs> or a front pack. Uh, you're gonna be, you're gonna be slow. I mean, the times that I've made the most strides 
in terms of speed have been related to weight. And I hate to say that because I hate focusing on weight, but you know, the unfortunate reality of speed and running is that it makes a big difference. Yeah. Right, unfortunately. So what happens if one of those cutoff points, you just cover your bib and stick your fingers in your ears and then run off? So that's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) La! Um, I don't know what would happen. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that they could like physically take you off the trail. I mean, the thing is, there's a lot of liability for that. Sure. sure. And that's why they have those cutoffs. I mean, yeah. um, No, it makes sense. (laughs) What would happen though? (laughs) <laughs> a thought experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Something to try, isn't it? <laughs> now, have you ever thought about like putting on your own 50 or 100 mile race where there are no cutoff times and you just do it at your own pace, you know? I have, um, I have a tendency, I, uh, I tend to bite off more than I can chew. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, uh, this film was a great example. Um, yeah. I, 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 thought I knew what I was in for and I still didn't know what I was in for. Everyone It's a big project, yeah. Everyone asks about the the running, but you know, quite honestly, I think the filmmaking process might have been the the harder, really? longer really? marathon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's yeah. brutal. It's brutal. And we when we initially um had the idea for the project, we pitched it and it got green lighted by a small studio in LA, Mm -hmm. Uh which three weeks later got acquired by a Japanese gaming company (laughs) that had no interest in the film division. (laughs) He was like, how does this happen? (laughs) Yeah, it was so exciting and then it immediately was shut down. And so, uh, you know, such a personal story and so many of the people that we had started to get involved with it were friends and they're like, ah, let's just still do it. Can we figure out how to to do it? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I missed my savings account, but I think it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, um, totally. But yeah, it was, it was a really hard, long five-year process. I mean, we had you know wow. fifteen people doing the work of what would normally be a thousand people on a feature wow. film. You know, and wow. So, yeah, it was fun though. It was like the best film school I ever could have gone to because yeah. I just had to oh figure goodness. it out. Yeah, but, yeah. So how much of it did you do? Like, did you? What parts of it did you film, and did you edit some of it? And like, how? Um, so I went through a pretty, uh, a pretty consistent cycle of getting to the next part of the filmmaking process, uh-huh. thinking that I could do it myself, yeah. learning how to do it, mm-hmm. realizing I couldn't do it myself, <laughs> <laughs> and hiring somebody else to do it. Yeah. Uh, like um, color grading was a great example. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people, which is kind of the, the hallmark of good color grading is when you don't notice it. But, um, you know, just any camera, you can take one camera and we could we could shoot something in here. We could go in the hallway, shoot something else, go upstairs, shoot something else, go outside, shoot something else. And even though it's the same camera, same settings, they're going to have a different look. They're going to have a different color temperature. <clears throat> yeah. And so uh, color grading, color correction is just fixing all of those mm-hmm. so that they look all the same. And you don't you, sh- you normally shouldn't notice it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a great example of something where it's like, you know, like, I think I have an, like, an eye for that. And I yeah. do. But I really discounted the like four years and thousands of hours of training and experience <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that an actual color grader needs. Yeah. So for almost everything, same with the editing, like I did a rough, a rough cut. I like loosely put the clips in the order in the yeah. in the order that I wanted to tell the story, and then somebody else came in and like very, and then uh, very it art, artfully <laughs> uh, <laughs> did the actual editing. Yeah. I think the the music is the only thing that I was smart enough to that. I am a musician, but uh-huh. because of that, I was smart enough to be like, yeah, no, I can't, I can't do that. So that yeah, was the one thing yeah. I didn't try to do myself. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's a beautiful film. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's, you know, it is, um, it is, um, we were talking, you were talking about story earlier and, and that's kind of the point I got to. I was like, I, this is not going to be the most beautiful film in the world. It's not going to be the slickest film in the world. It's not going to be the best marketed film in the world. But I think, we have an interesting story and I think we can tell an interesting story. So for whatever, you know, everything it is and it isn't, I think at the very least, I think it's a hopefully a compelling story. It's yeah. inspirational. Yeah. I've watched it twice and I've oh, cried gosh. both times. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a whole other, uh, me too. <laughs> uh, and I, that was an interesting experience that I had never <clears throat> experienced as a creative. I, Really never thought about what it would be like to have to watch it over and over and over yeah. and over again. And it's such a personal story. 
that, I mean, I still cry <laughs> when I watch it for different reasons, yeah. but it, um, it got to the point at the end where I like, I just, I couldn't even watch it. Like we do screenings and I just like have to like duck out. Yeah. Um, Cause it's, I just, just kind of over reliving it yeah. <laughs> over and over yeah. again, you know, Honestly. it's like I've kind of uh, mo moved on and healed <laughs> like, and maybe yeah. this was my catharsis. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I remember the last, right before I sent it to the distributor, I emailed one of my friends and I was like, I think I might've just watched my film for the last time. Thank God. <laughs> That's not because I don't love it, but you yeah. know, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of reliving it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah totally. for sure. But sure. yeah, no, the, the way that the end was spliced together and the music and everything and the back flash pictures and everything, I just... Oh, that was, yeah. the, that was one of the editing choices uh, that I made and that came out of everyone everyone always asked like what are you thinking about during uh -huh. these things oh, yeah uh -huh. I was like I don't you know anything I, anything and everything like usually not running I'm usually spacing mm -hmm. and thinking about everything other than running and so I had that idea at the finish line of like is there a way in the film to uh, show visually you. show like what my mind was doing yeah, yeah. So totally I feel like it's yeah. almost <clears throat> almost like a near-death experience you know like you know people say that their life flashes before their eyes yeah. or before they die i feel like it's kind of the same thing where all of a sudden everything leading up to that moment just flashes before your eyes yeah you know? and you get so loopy and you don't even yeah. you don't um I, I i remember you know i would as a huge motivator during training i would imagine oh what's it gonna be like when i cross the finish line yeah like, you know picture it and imagine it and it was nothing like like i had pictured <laughs> It was almost like kind of numb, you know. I mean, it's yeah. I, I, in the it doesn't look like I'm not emotional in the film. It's I'm just a little numb, you know. You're just you're not all there. It just happened. Yeah, <laughs> you're like yeah. give me a burrito. <laughs> yeah, well, and the one I finished was in was in Texas, and it was a smaller hundred miler, and um, I mean, not that I needed confetti and stuff, but it's also weird to have been like working for towards something for a uh -huh. year and a half. You imagine what it's going to be like. And it turns out at the end, like, it's just you kind of walking over a plastic strip in the woods, you know? It's like, oh, you're done. Right? Like, yeah. 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 I feel like we've kind of, like, spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. But... Yeah. Good for that, the disclaimer. You have to watch the film <laughs> so you can appreciate it. Yeah. So, like, I absolutely loved the mesh of, like, traditional documentary, documentary I can say words, mm -hmm. and, and the, like, uh, comedy set like that was so cool yeah. how, how did you like how, how did you decide on that because it's not like you don't see that like that's not I don't, has anyone done that before I think you might be the first um I don't know you know Chelsea Handler has started doing some cool stuff for Netflix but I guess it's pretty like other than her and being inherently funny I guess it's not like proper stand-up or storytelling I don't know I'm sure I'm not the first yeah. but I have always uh, loved as an actor, uh, slamming, um, well, manipulating the audience uh, to a point of tension, and then being able to release it with with humor. I love that. <clears throat> um, I mean, all all playwriting, story creation is uh, you know ups and downs of creating and releasing tension, and I love releasing tension with humor. Um, I, I love when you're just, you know, on the edge of your seat at the point of tears and you just mm -hmm. get slapped across the face with a, a funny moment. And the, oh, the bar is low. It doesn't even have to be that funny because, you know, the audience, like, you don't realize it, but you're desperate to, to, to not be so tense. Um, yeah. Horror films use it a lot, not with humor, yeah. but I mean, you know, it's all about uh, tension and release. Yeah. Um, so I, I've always loved that. And so mm. I, th I thought it was a, you know, an obvious... Uh, marriage and from a, an editing standpoint it was really fun to be able to like craft the storytelling in that way because all the, the 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 run was filmed all of that was done first mm -hmm. yeah. so it was fun to look at the footage and like what's the what do we have what's yeah. the story here and where are their gaps mm -hmm. and then I could write uh, you know some of the stand-up was already written but a lot of this stand -up, it's really kind of stand-up storytelling I mean yeah. there are some jokey jokes but it's mm -hmm. kind of a hybrid between the two but it was fun to be able to fill in the blanks of like, of the story and, and manipulate yeah. it the way the way we we wanted to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought it was like I loved it. I died. I think my favorite was 
your jalapeno story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I I love uh, I love I, I I call them poop jokes with a purpose. I love like I love middle school humor, but I also love humor that's part of a bigger, more substantial story. And I mean, I think the yeah. film is probably a good example of that. I mean, I'm telling literal poop jokes, um, <laughs> but they're hopefully part of a bigger, more substantial yeah. story. Yeah, also I love any time that you just like did your dad's voice. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it's not accurate at all. <laughs> it was just like so great, like, oh man. It was, yeah. <laughs> I was like, dead panda. Yeah, <clears throat> so I, I love that. Um, oh, I, <laughs> sorry, I just want to share my favorite part. Me and my husband were, were watching it, and the part where you're just talking about how you're struggling, the neck guy runs by, and you're like, so that guy is doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I silently curse at anyone who passes me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I don't care that they pass me. It's just they look like they're not in pain and having a good time. I'm having a good time, big picture, but... Yeah. You know, they just don't look like they're hurting as bad as I am. And it usually pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you not hurt my mom? <laughs> I totally feel that. And it's, isn't it funny how you're like, oh, I totally don't care. I'm just doing this for fun. Someone passes you and you're like, you're an idiot. <laughs> even cars. Car, for some reason, cars even piss me yeah. off when they pass me. It's like, who do you think you are sitting there when you're air conditioning, <laughs> rolling up this hill? <laughs> but I'm out here working so hard. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> yeah. oh, that's hilarious. Oh yeah. So, what did your like family and friends think of this this whole experience? Obviously, like it was jump started by this really emotionally difficult time point in your life, really precipitated by by some difficult, you know, years. I mean, eleven years wasn't it of uh, uh, seventeen or something like that? Seventeen. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, uh, I guess when you decided to do this, what was your family and friends reaction and then like how how did you get people on board and, and kind of yeah um they thought i was crazy but i i have a habit of having crazy ideas that's kind of always been my jam um nobody tried to talk me out of it they were all just i think they're all worried yeah <laughs> they were all worried i think they were just worried because um well I, I wouldn't say there aren't dangers involved in ultra running. It's not mm -hmm. quite as ridiculous as it seems to people who aren't runners. It's crazy, mm -hmm. but it's not as it's not as crazy as it seems. Um, so I think I kind of I finally got them on board with that. Um, I think they were excited. My mom and I were really close, and I really struggled after she passed away. Yeah. And I think they were really glad that I had something to focus on. Yeah. I think they probably worried that it was an unhealthy obsession, which I think um, a lot of runners probably have people who <laughs> wonder that, and it, it can, that can happen. Um, yeah. But it was just that that's, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to hang out with myself in the woods for 12 mm -hmm. hours. That's, yeah. it's, like, I mean, there's definitely other things you could have like become obsessed with or turned yeah, to. Like absolutely. It's, it's yeah, absolutely. I feel like a very healthy way If you're to gonna have... obsess over something, I'm yeah. like, uh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I could really relate um, to just from personal experiences. I've, I haven't had a parent um, pass away, but when you talked about just having that net pulled out from underneath you, I feel like, um, I think that was just a really beautiful way to put it. I, I feel like a lot of people have experienced that in different ways of just like kind of having that safety net or, or that rock and then all of a sudden it's gone and yeah. you're just kind of floating in the universe and you're like, what do you hang on to, you know? Yeah, I, uh, like that was the moment I became an adult. <laughs> Because I realized that, <clears throat> I mean, I was an adult, but I realized that I was kind of going through life, like knowing that that was always there. Like, yeah. you know, we're, I, I, I grew up, like, luckily we were financially stable and, and all those things. My parents were always together. <laughs> and I just like always had a sense of like, whatever happens, like worst case scenario, like I can go home. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I can still go home. Yeah. But it's yeah. just not the same. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 It was brutal. Right. Yeah. So so you talked about, I mean, so you use running as like coping and, and getting through it. Um, how how else did you cope? Was it, did you just kind of go to another place when you were running? Um, do you know what I'm saying? Like what, what yeah. other things did you do to get through that? Well, in general, anytime Jeffrey has big emotions, uh -huh. he disappears. 
just about I'm not a like I'm not a talk about it kind of person. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. not a like distract myself with people kind of person. Mm-hmm. I'm a like I'll be back in a few days when I feel better. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Um what was the original question? I've already forgot. Like like what else did you do to help? <laughs> oh. Um I think disappear, like, and not just running. I mean, I would just like go away for the weekend. I would just, um, that's how I coped with it. And I, it it sounds unhealthy, but I think for me, it's, it's how I operate. And I think it's the best, the best way. Um, I think most of the energy went towards running though. I don't, I can't really think of any other. um, And that, that does take up most of your time, right? When you're training for a race like that. I don't know how married people with children or quite frankly any adult responsibilities <laughs> do this because i was a 32 year old single childless bachelor and it still consumed all of my time i can't yeah. imagine like having to worry about other humans while you're trying to run that much the trick is you marry someone who will run it with you that's smart <laughs> that's smart and Be you just have a really big budget for the babysitters so there you go there you go yeah so I guess in this whole process over the past several years, what are the what have been the biggest takeaways from it all for you? Um, I think probably being kind to myself. Cool. Not that I was ever not kind, but I think you know, as a chubby dude getting into running, it's there are obviously it's not the it's not the expected environment yeah. and so i think like getting to a point where it was like you know what today's run didn't go as planned like whatever like it's not the end of the world mm-hmm. go home try again tomorrow like there's no reason to beat yourself up like mm-hmm. uh, i i have my motivation skyrockets and then then plummets and i've learned to like hey when it plummets it's you're overextended like you're just you just need you need a break um I'm finally at the point where, like, I will be the biggest person at the starting line, and I don't care. Awesome. I used to care. Yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey used to care a lot. Yeah. And I'm finally at the point where, like, I just don't. Yeah. That's awesome. So I think, you know, just, like, <clears throat> keeping expectations in check and mm-hmm. and trying to keep perspective on, like, what actually matters and yeah. what doesn't, which is hard. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that's number one. Do you feel like that's transferred over, like, to other areas in your life? Oh, yeah. Like, a definite, like, just, like, total DGAF attitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I care about the right, well, I say the right things. I mean, there's always, you know, I'll keep growing, and I'm, I'm sure uh, become even better at it. But, yeah, there's just so many things that I would have cared so much about eight years ago that I just, yeah. whatever. I, I, uh, I have a, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a little kid. Yeah. Uh, and my favorite thing to do whenever I get like super stressed about something that I know is stupid, but I'm stressed about it nonetheless, mm-hmm. is watch space documentaries. <laughs> if you want to feel like there you, you don't matter, <laughs> <laughs> I like nothing matters, uh, watch, watch a documentary about the size of our, our universe. And oh, I, I can't handle <laughs> you'll that suddenly stuff. have a bit better perspective, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I don't remember, I think it was listening to another thing, an interview you'd done or something, but you talked about this experience that you had at the doctor's office and mm. you just checked your heart yeah. and you brought in the resident. Yeah. Will you, can you tell that story? Will you, will you do that again real quick? Yeah, well, it was right before I did Leadville. So the first hundred miler that I was attempting and I, understandably, because I had just lost my mom to heart disease that runs in our family and I was, had not come from a place of health. I was very paranoid <laughs> about mm-hmm. not only my heart, but just my health in general and whether or not it was safe to do this. I mean, that that was probably the primary concern of my family was that it wasn't safe to be mm-hmm. running this much. Mm-hmm. So I had scheduled a final checkup with my doctor two or three weeks before Leadville just to make sure I was still, it was still healthy for me to do this. And yeah, so I went in, he did all the normal checks and he listened to my heart. And he moved the stethoscope and listened again. He moved it and listened again. He did a little like confused dog head tilt and listened again. And uh, he was like, uh, uh, can, can you hold on for just a second? I'll be right back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he left and I'm sure it was like 17 seconds, but it felt like an hour. And I just like slowly spiraled into like, this is it. Like he's found something with my heart. I, not only can I, am I not gonna be able to do this run, 
that I have spent so much money and so many people are rearranging their lives to come help me with. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm, uh, I have heart failure. Like my clock has started uh, now, like just, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> off the wall. I mean, understandable, but you know, r real crazy spiral. Mm -hmm. And they eventually came back and he came back in the room with this younger guy and said, Hey, this is so-and-so, uh, he's a resident here. Uh, I just wanted him to listen to your heart because it's not very often we get to listen to the heart rate of an endurance athlete. Dude, that's awesome. It's like, what did that's you call me? So awesome. <laughs> what did you call me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, even at the, which a low heart rate can be a bad thing too. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think my resting heart rate was a, like a little under 60. And I was at yeah. the doctor, which is inherently like nerve wracking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even know at the time that that was an indicator of a well conditioned uh, heart. But anyway, it was just like a huge turning point for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I was like, what? I'm an athlete? <laughs> I mean, I, whatever, you know, uh, yeah. whatever an, an athlete, quote unquote, is. Um, but yeah, I had never been called something like that. Oh my goodness. I love that story. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really memorable. Do you feel like since running this and being more active, do you just have more energy? Do you feel better? Oh, yeah. And I didn't even realize how crappy I felt because I yeah. had always been a, uh, I had always been overweight and pretty unhealthy. Uh, mm -hmm. I did, again, I was forced to play sports as a kid, <laughs> but really half-assed it. I remember I played basketball in middle school. Oh, I think I, my sister mentions this in the film. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I played basketball in middle school and my coach, bless his heart, he mm -hmm. tried so hard, but I had just had the worst of attitude. I don't even, I think yeah. I was like refusing to run up and down the court <laughs> and he took me out of the game and he was my one of my best friend's dad. So I, mean, yeah. I knew this man really well. Yeah. yeah. He's like, Jeffrey, I will put you back in the game when you come to, to me and you say, I want to play basketball. Yeah. And I sat on the bench for the rest of the game <laughs> because I was not going to lie to him <laughs> and tell him I wanted to be there. Yeah. That's funny. Oh, yeah. So when I say I played sports, that's me playing yeah. sports. <laughs> It just took you a second to find the sport that you were really passionate about, right? Yeah. Well, and I also realized that um, I'm outdoorsy. Like, I had always been involved mm -hmm. in, you know, I was always, like, in, in theater and music. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really considered myself outdoorsy. But, you know, I grew up on a farm. And now looking back, like, I mean, I played outside all day. But I still didn't, you know, I just, I never considered myself outdoorsy. And then I moved to New York City. Mm -hmm. And it took about five years. And I slowly started to go like real stir crazy. Mm -hmm. I like, I bought a bike for a while. I like went, would, in, in New York, like I had to take the subway to a different train, to a bus, to a different bus, to get to a trailhead, to go backpacking. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I, um, that was a huge reason for moving to LA. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. um, I had just started to get into running and it wasn't as fun to run in New York. And I just, I wanted to be outside and it's hard to access in New York if you yeah. don't have a car. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, what, um, are there any other last things that you would like to mention or just say before? I don't know. I think we covered it all. Okay. Yeah. I guess, what would you tell to people that are in your situation from maybe like uh, uh, multiple standpoints, right? Like maybe they've struggled with weight. Maybe they like, you know, they're grieving over a parent, something like that. Like what, what would you say to those people? Yeah, well, I think I got lucky. I, it wasn't purposeful, but I think I got lucky that my coping mechanism turned out to be healthy. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, if you have the wherewithal in those moments to choose something healthier to obsess over, I think that's a great idea. Mm. Um, and I think just, uh, it, it's a big picture sort of cliche, but I mean, I, I, I think just not quitting, which is um, probably the first big lesson I learned in ultra running mm -hmm. was... You know, what happens when you get to that point on a run where it's arguably not fun anymore, like things are starting to hurt, mm -hmm. you're tired, you're grumpy, um, and any reasonable person would, it's time to quit. Like you had, a, you had a great run, you got to the point where you stop and you stop and go home. Mm -hmm. But it turns out if you don't stop and you like for whatever reason are foolish enough to keep running, <laughs> well, you have something to eat and your mood changes. Mm -hmm. That weird cramp in the side of your leg wasn't a big deal and went away at a mile later. Mm -hmm. um, and so it turns out that like, some really cool stuff happens when you just stubbornly refuse to quit. And, and that was a huge key in ultra running for me because it took me a long time to realize that if I just kept going, it, it, I, it would be fine. I, I was capable of a lot more than I thought I was. That's awesome. I think that's great advice to keep going. 
Yeah. Yeah. Which is one more um, question. So the um, the name of your movie. Who who was the call by again? Uh, May West. May West. Yeah. How did you like come to find that that quote and and like how? Yeah, what made you decide on that for your for the for the title of your film? Yeah, so I had heard it when I was younger. The quote is, um, "You only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough." And I had learned, I had heard it a, a long, long time ago, and I maybe this gives away how simple my mind is, but in, <laughs> inspirational quotes are really effective for me. Sometimes mm-hmm. when I'm having a hard time getting motivated. Um, I'll just like Google motivational, okay, inspirational quotes. Awesome. Yeah. Like they get me going. Like yeah. they, they, you know, they always spark an idea that I wouldn't have otherwise had that that, that gets me out the door. Um, and so I was just doing that one day, and I saw that one again, and it just hit me. I was like, ah, that's it. Yeah. And I also loved it, like in the context for the film, which uh, is is the point. But a lot of people have come up and said like, oh, I saw the title of the film. Once is enough. I thought it was like, oh, running a hundred miler. Once is enough. And then oh. I heard the quote at the end of the film and it like hit me and I got it. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was the goal for it to have a, yeah, yeah. two meanings or, or a fake meaning, I guess. Rather. Yeah. 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 I love well, it. I think well, it's well, beautiful meaning. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Yeah, of course. It was a blast. Yeah. Yeah, you too. I feel awesome. like we could have spent hours here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah honestly. Yeah. So thank you again. Um, if people wanted to follow you, where can they find you? Uh, at Jeffrey Binney on all the social medias uh, and uh, my website, jjb.life. Awesome. And again, check out the film, um, Once is Enough. Um, thank you again for being here. And yeah. Don't forget to like, comment, and share this with someone who you feel like needs to hear it, and we will catch you guys next week. Thanks for listening to Running Unbroken. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and reach out if you or someone you know has a story to share.